I'm Dawn Ham and I'm the ATA president. I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to the first of our series of warm up to topicals programs, which will, as Bill said, will go through March. Uh, I'd like to introduce you first to Jennifer Miller, our executive director, who's down there with the sheep. Wave, Jennifer. She's the one who keeps it all going, folks, and we appreciate her every single day. Um, I would like to just mention that it's not too late to register for our program this coming Saturday. Uh, Dr. Jean Wang, who is a hematologist and leukemia researcher and a member of Canada Post Stamp Advisory Committee, the group that chooses the stamps that will be issued in Canada, is going to speak and give us a behind the scenes look at how the 2020 Canadian Medical Groundbreakers stamp issue what came about from very uh, first initial idea to the launch. She's a very accomplished speaker and I know that you'll you'll enjoy that one. And speaking of accomplished speakers, I am really delighted to introduce Greg Philipson, who is one of the foremost collectors of World War II related and Jewish historical artifacts in the country. He's an authority on the Holocaust, Jewish military history, and Jewish fig figures in the US wars. He will introduce us to the involvement of the artist Theodore Geisel in the war effort. Greg speaks widely and travels giving programs to, as he told us a little bit before the, this, this meeting started to all different groups. So welcome Greg, we're so pleased that you've agreed to join us this evening. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and it's nice to meet everyone. It's a really nice crowd. I see we've got 44 connections on here. So thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and get this started. And uh, let me just put it in full screen mode. How's that looking for everybody? Good. Looking good. Okay. So um, I, I know you mentioned that I collect a lot of things today. If just uh, before we get started because of the intro, uh, Dr. Seuss was not, he was a fine Christian gentleman. And uh, um, just uh, so he is not part of our Jewish collection, but he is part of our World War II propaganda and uh, political cartoonist uh, collection. And that covers a, uh, a wide variety of different religions, uh, faiths and so on. Uh, I'm just going to make my fix my screen a little bit so I don't see everybody quite so big there. Anyway, uh, you can see uh, this is called Dr. Seuss Goes to War and Before. So what we're going to do tonight is try to have uh, uh, give everybody an opportunity to learn something new, perhaps something that you didn't know about Dr. Seuss, uh, you know, Theodore Geisel. And um, probably the best place to start is with a little bit of a bio about him. So born in 1904 in Springfield, Massachusetts, he passed away in 1991. Uh, he was a Boy Scout. We're going to talk a little bit about that. It's a, actually an important um, piece of uh, history in his own personal history. Uh, he's a graduate of Dartmouth College. And uh, I might also add that in recent years, the Geisel family uh, it's now the uh, Geisel Medical School there. Um, they made the single largest financial contribution to Dartmouth College in history, I believe. And uh, so the, the school is named after him. Now, I like kind of the, the, the kind of almost humor behind that because uh, Dr. Seuss. So where does that pen name come from? Many people ask me that later on. So let's cover it now. Um, Seuss is his mother's maiden name, and because his parents really wanted him to be a doctor, uh, when he finished Dartmouth, he went on to Oxford University but dropped out, and he decided he was more interested in touring Europe, um, where he actually ended up meeting his first wife, Helen. So uh, that, that's kind of the, uh, the little story behind that, Dr. Seuss. It's a, a little bit of personal humor for him. As you can see in the photograph uh, on the far left there, he was a major in the US Army during World War II in the special services uh, area. And you can see a kind of a neat art artist rendition of him uh, with the cat in the hat in the, in the background there. 
but long before he did many of his uh, children's books, um, there were some books he did in the, in the late 30s and so on, but he was a cartoonist for magazines like Vanity Fair, Life, Judge, PM Daily was a New York City newspaper. He worked for a long time for Standard Oil, ESSO, their marine products and uh, lubrication products uh, division. And as I mentioned earlier, he worked at, for the War Department doing art and animation scripts for the U.S. Army. So what you'll see mostly, but not completely, are um, script writing for movies like Your Job in Germany uh, and others that we'll talk about later in the presentation. Designed for Death, which was a follow-on to uh, Our Job in Japan, a, uh, we'll talk more about that, won a 1947 Academy Award. And for those of you that may know this, if you've served, uh, you might know the word, uh, the term snafu. And uh, for tonight's purposes, uh, we're going to call it situation normal, all fouled up. And uh, Private Snafu were a series of uh, animated cartoons for young soldiers. Remember, during the Second World War, you had a million people in there, uh, millions of soldiers, men and women in arms, and uh, mainly for the, for the young men. Um, these were uh, instructional movies that uh, were cartoons and uh, kind of uh, easy to train people, uh, something that would get their attention, something rather lighthearted. Um, so with that, let's move on. And I wanted to talk more about Boy Scouts. And this is really important. He was member of Troop 13 in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he grew up. And although this poster is, is not in our collection, I used it because it's a World War I uh, Boy Scout um, uh, by US War Bonds poster. So during that period, his grandfather was a, a brewer up in, uh, in Massachusetts and a fairly to-do guy financially. Um, there was a big contest in the Boy Scouts and the top 10 sales um, uh, the, the top 10 uh, Boy Scouts who had the best sales would get an award from, uh, at that time, former President uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So uh, uh, Seuss was one of the top ones, Geisel was one of the top 10, and he was 10th in line on the stage when uh, Roosevelt was there to hand out the awards. Something happened and Roosevelt never, was only given nine awards. And when he got to uh, Geisel, he said, what are you doing here? And Geisel was thoroughly embarrassed, didn't know what to do. And from that day forward, as you may know, he never did television interviews. He did a few book signings, but very, very rarely ever made a public appearance. He was so humiliated um, on stage uh, with, with that particular event. It was life altering for him candidly. Now let's talk, uh, because this is a, a stamp group, I've thrown in just about everything I have on uh, Dr. Seuss philatelically, and some of it will be more interesting than this, but in 1999, um, the first uh, Dr. Seuss uh, related stamp came out as part of the uh, uh, Celebrate the Century. And in the night, this is the, the, the uh, decade of the 1950s, the cat in the hat, um, uh, stamp. It was widely loved and sold. And uh, as you can see, it came out the postmark of Springfield, Massachusetts, where Dr. Seuss was from. It's a nice first day cover. And for uh, in case you didn't know this, uh, stamps during the 1990s, I know the Civil War stamps, a number of different stamps had these. Um, they would have on the, this is the sheet that came with the, um, uh, the booklet, if you will. Um, they would put the uh, information, these were gum stamps, not self-adhesive, and uh, put a description of what the stamp is or who the person was uh, on the back of the stamp. It was kind of fun, these 33 cent issues. Uh, of course, um, you know, many of us have uh, uh, from years ago collected some of those subscription stamps with the, uh, I don't know, gold plated or whatever those stamps are, but this is a uh, uh, talks about Celebrate the Century, a pop, popular children's book, um, just to give you an idea of what the uh, gold stamp looked like, if you will, there. Now, I thought this was really funny, and I had to have this, but it's a cat in the hat keepsake ornament from Hallmark. You would have found these in 1999 in their stores uh, at Christmas time. And uh, it's a replica, uh, it's not the actual stamp, but of that cat in the hat stamp. That's how popular it was. 
Now, these kinds of things came out, and I was glad to get this. Um, this is the 2004 issue. It's a first day of issue card, if you will. And that is the actual Theodore Geisel. And you can see the cat in the hat, uh, the Grinch, and other um, you know, characters that he created in his books and in all of his artwork. And it was nice because it's a nation of readers uh, stamp. And of course, um, it, 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 you'd be hard pressed almost in any um, westernized country, um, even overseas. We have a copy of the Cat in the Hat in Yiddish, for example, um, in our collection. Um, they, to just get an idea of that 37 cent stamp and a kind of a neat little image of Dr. Seuss, a little uh, historical thing. This is what the uh, first day of issue ceremony was like. Uh, again, I meant to mention this earlier, La Jolla, California is where he spent his adult life uh, after World War II. And uh, uh, his papers, besides the ones that we have and some that are at the uh, University of Texas, is S uh, uh, the lion's share of his SO oil material um, is, uh, is here in Austin. But uh, that, that, that's where that was uh, postmarked for the first day. Now, I found this. This is not in our collection, but this person does a lot of really unusual first day covers. And I, uh, I, it's, it's for sale. I could have bought it. It just doesn't really fit all that well in the collection. Uh, and, uh, 25 of the 100 uh, of these covers, these NH, uh, HN rather, local post covers. And if anybody knows what this is really about, I have no idea. Terror 1, Terror 2, Terror 3. Um, don't know who those are. I guess maybe uh, Saddam Hussein or somebody like that. But I just thought it was rather interesting that they used the Dr. Seuss one um, on that and made Terra Free kind of a cow in the hat. Um, don't really know much about the, uh, the history behind that, but I thought it was unusual enough to put it in here. Um, in uh, 2006, this, uh, the third in a series of Dr. Seuss related stamps came out and it was part of a series of uh, children's book characters and what have you. And I really like this. This is Fox in Socks. And uh, I like this one because it, um, uh, it was sent directly to me, as you can see in Austin, uh, somebody just coincidentally using that Fox in Socks uh, 39 cent stamp from 2006. Now, when you look, this, this, uh, what you see are the uh, eight stamps down below, those were part of a, a bigger sheet but I only show this to give you an idea of um, who is there. And I want, just because of it's very close to my heart, Curious George stamp down on, on the bottom there. And some of you, although it's not Dr. Seuss related, uh, may have seen this stamp. I mean, it's not that old, it's in 2006, of course. And it talks about children's books, animals, and that's a first day of issue cover. Um, and what the ceremony cover looked like. And what's really nice about the ceremony is that the uh, cover has the um, Curious George stamp, but the, um, uh, the insert has uh, Fox and Sox. So uh, I thought that was kind of good. But what's really important about Curious George is that he, this is a book in our collection and it's really not a story about Curious George per se. It's a story about Margaret and H.A. Ray um, a Jewish couple from Europe who were caught up in the Holocaust and somehow managed to escape. So even Curious George has a Holocaust connection, and that's what this book is about, The Journey That Saved Curious George, um, their trek to try to escape um, the Nazis and their collaborators in Europe um, in the 1930s. Now, this is something rather interesting. So you see, my name is Greg with two G's on the end. And I found this cover and it says to Greg from Dr. Seuss. Well, it's obviously a forgery and I wouldn't buy that, but I pulled this off of eBay to show you something rather interesting. So there you go. It happens to be to a, a, someone named Greg, uh, same spelling as, as me, Dr. Seuss and the cat in the hat. Here's the actual listing on eBay. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody's trying to sell that as an original Dr. Seuss thing for $1,750 or make your best offer? I was going to make an offer for $3.50, $3.50, but I thought it might be insulting. So now let's get into some early Dr. Seuss. This is a Judge magazine from 1933. 
And that illustration is one of my all-time favorites that he's done for a number of reasons. It's entitled After, After Dark in the Park. And look at the characters in here. You see, um, and we know about Yertle the turtle. Look at the turtles, the fish, red fish, blue fish. Uh, my wife has a shirt that goes red fish, blue fish, yellow fish, gefilte fish. And uh, if some of you may uh, appreciate that, uh, if you know what gefilte fish is. Um, anyway, it's a really clever, clever illustration. And notice those uh, antelopes or whatever they are in the center, his characters. You'll notice that there's a lot of recurring uh, characters that he's drawn in, in many things, as we just mentioned here. But inside this particular magazine, it says, Ye Knights of Ye Round Table. And look at how he signed that. Dr. Theoropodus Seuss. And he would always, in his early days, make funny names and always got the Seuss name in there, but always had some kind of fun. And notice also how these illustrations are so much different than some of the things you'll see later as his artwork progressed. Um, and of course, as we get into the 1930s and 40s, you'll see how the tone of these things uh, deeply changed as well. This is a 1934 cover of Life magazine. And this is really adorable. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the bird or the parrot type bird is saying to the, uh, to the ape with the little baby, well, that's nothing compared to, you know, hatching an egg. Just cute little ditties that he would put on everything. And as you can see in the 1930s, recovering from the, um, uh, from the Great Depression, uh, you see the NRA, which is the National Recovery Act. Um, trying to get the country back on its feet. And of course, the uh, clearly marked Dr. Seuss signature on the bottom of the artwork. Now, this is something that was done. We have uh, some really good stuff from this Thomas Murphy Calendar Company out of Sioux City, Iowa. And these are actual color proofs of artwork that Dr. Seuss did for a calendar. And uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of color separation ones from a, a, a later calendar in 1935, but these are all from the 1930s, along with that full color card, which was one of the final editions. And you notice that same uh, antelope, if you will, uh, with the little parrots on top of the lovebirds. And this is rare stuff, but it gives you an idea of where Dr. Seuss's material was being, um, uh, was, was being promoted. And this is the Thomas Murphy, uh, look at the size of that place for producing a printing company, mainly calendars. And this is a nice, um, uh, a nice uh, uh, postcard with of course a one cent uh, postcard right down there uh, from uh, postmark in uh, Red Oak, Iowa in 1929. Now this is a cover of um, uh, the New York Woman Magazine. And this is a pretty, this is the only one of these. This, this came out of a magazine. And you notice the, in kind of the wispy clouds with the uh, more modern city, if you will, um, in the background. And this was um, Maternity Marches On. And it's a very, very cute little thing where you see the waiting tent with the Amer Native Americans uh, waiting for the babies to be born, the uh, stork bringing out the... Uh, uh, the babies, notice the feathers and so on. It was a really cute little thing uh, talking about the Columbia Medical Center um, and their new uh, maternity wing that was uh, uh, being advertised here. This, uh, I, I, this is very, very rare. We have two full sheets of this from a Sunday paper and I've only seen about four total. Um, this is called Hijai and it's uh, a Sunday funnies. And it's really remarkable. This may be one of the only not successful ventures that uh, Theodore Geisel entered into. This rant ran for only a few months in 1935 from April to June. And it has kind of that Alibaba, you know, uh, sort of look to it. And it was about that bird. You see it in the center there. It says the Pitsu bird. That was a character he used along with the um, um, the fellow with the turban on his head and so on, just did not take off and uh, uh, very, very few of these actually exist. This is one of the two from our collection. Now, some of you also may not know that Dr. Seuss was in the beer business. And we have a couple of very rare advertisements that uh, ran, that's uh, obviously a goat or a ram of some sort, 
uh, for Schaefer Bach beer. And what he did a lot more of was for uh, Narragansett beer in Rhode Island. Um, these are some coasters and a real beer tray um, advertising their ale, their lager and their ale. And that's a character he calls Chief Gansett. And this was a huge, huge advertising hit. Um, this was a very, very famous uh, ad campaign that Dr. Seuss was involved in. Now, moving along into the um, ESO or the Seuss Navy as they created. So these were glasses. There's a variety of different glasses that were handed, away, handed out at gas stations. You know, premiums years, you know, gas was uh, 25 cents a gallon. And even at that, you'd get premiums with it when you filled up. The little pin in the center is meat gus. And on the back, the little paper insert talks all about SO oil and so on. And that ashtray is pretty rare. Do you notice it's a seal with an admiral's cap on? And it's, he's the nuzzle pus, part of the Seuss Navy. And these were used in the 1930s, mainly around 1939, when uh, Seuss, when the Esso Marine dealers all met in, um, uh, at Hotel Astor in New York City for their annual convention. And these are the kinds of things that would be on the tables. You know, a lot of people smoked back then. And of course, for the SO dealers, um, Secrets of the Deep, we have all of the different ones here, but I like this one. It's just kind of cute how Seuss illustrated all of these uh, dealer information booklets and what have you. This is one of two uh, very, very rare Seuss Navy certificates when you would be awarded an admiralty. And what I really like about this is not only the artwork, these were for dealers for you know really outstanding performance and so on, um, notice the seal. That seal is a paper seal that uh, had gum on it and is stuck onto the, um, onto the certificate. And it's the official seal on a seal. So you notice that seal is the nuzzle pus guy. So he's even making jokes when he makes a seal. Really adorable stuff. And here's what it looks like, the envelope uh, that this would have been mailed in. It's the Seuss Navy headquarters. Uh, on Broadway in New York, very close to where uh, my very first job was in New York City many, many years ago. And uh, anyway, uh, and this is just a, another example of the certificate. Now, this is really something that uh, many people are not aware of. This was another giveaway for SO lubrication products. And you can see the SO uh, oil can up in the uh, top right of the puzzle. So I forgot how many pieces are in this actual puzzle, but it's... Um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, just a puzzle would have come up in pieces in these bags. This is a big brown paper bag, fairly large, and you're seeing the front and back of it. And uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle, and of course, it features all of the characters that he has in there. Notice the big green one with the crank in his mouth from the uh, car. But the funniest part of this to me is when you look at the back side and it says the cast of characters you know, Carbonacus and uh, so on. But he even identifies the motorist, his wife and child. Never, this guy never lost his sense of humor ever. And these are three full-size advertisements, really large scale advertisements in full color um, that ran in the New York Times in the 1930s. Uh, I've only seen one other uh, time, a couple of, not all three of them, but they were really ripped up in bad shape. Uh, I'm so glad to have these in the collection. And if you look at the, um, not only are they full color, but you even see the uh, two of the Marx brothers in the center one down in the bottom left. Uh, beautiful ads, and you can imagine, there's the foil, the carbo knock, knock his guy um, on the top uh, left there. And again, this is uh, from Yachting Magazine, of which I have a number, but this is one that's really interesting. It's in, you know, uh, uh, three color, and um, it's, uh, it's a centerfold in that particular issue. And it just shows all the different characters. You see Neptune up in the top left and so on. Um, it's, it's just uh, quite an adorable thing in most regards. And uh, uh, the kind of advertising that Esso Marine product was doing for their oils and grease products for boats. Although this, I borrowed this from the web. I wish I owned this. Uh, it wasn't for sale. This is an SO Marine uh, dealer. Uh, they call it their annual maneuvers for the Seuss Navy. 
And if you'll notice, it's all men, number one, which was not uncommon in 1939. You see, it's January 39. The war hasn't quite started yet in Europe. We're about nine months away from that. And um, you can see they're all in a particular, almost all in a particular hat. And it's a Seuss Navy hat. And I was able finally, there's a blow up of the photograph, but there's the Admiral in the Seuss Navy hat from our collection. And uh, it's the only third one I've ever seen. And they, they go for quite a bit. And I wasn't about to lose the third one because I'm glad I did because uh, uh, I bought it because I've not seen another one since. And I've had that for quite a while. Um, in their uh, SO dealer magazines, you would see this one's really nice. You see it's a uh, bulk postage paid out of New York uh, from their uh, Broadway headquarters. And uh, there you go. There's a little take it easy, uh, says Bob Hodges and several di uh, two different little uh, Seuss illustrations in this SO dealer magazine. This is uh, February of 41. The war is raging in Europe, uh, yet we are still um, uh, 10 months away from entering the war ourselves. And this, I'm not sure what happened to this cover, but this is a real beauty. Um, th this was either burned or torn or something, but you can see it's from the Seuss Navy um, 1939, December 23rd, uh, war has already started in Europe and it has a receiving cancel in um, uh, Grove City, Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, it's, you can see the 1939 uh, postmark off to the right there at Grove City as well. And this is what was it with it when it came. Um, it's only the front of that cover, by the way. And it's the Seuss Navy and some sort of advertising thing, ad annual maneuvers and target practices uh, coming up on January 11. So uh, kind of a fun thing. You see the Seuss illustration on there. And of course, the uh, SO Marine products. And notice how they uh, sign it, Dr. Seuss, Admiral in Chief uh, and Cartographer, Quenna, however you pronounce that. So um, more of his little humor everywhere. Um, this card, although it's not specifically dated, probably um, around 1946, just after World War II, you can see how different dealers um, would be using these cards. This one's out of uh, Riverdale, Maryland, would send these out to notify people that your car needed service or something along those lines. This is another one, does have a postmark from New Haven, Connecticut in 1947. Same kind of card, different dealer. Uh, you put in the date, your car needs service on, on, you know, in November of 47. Now, these two were once in our collection. This is uh, along with this letter and one other uh, uh, um, uh, painting. Um, I bought these from a woman whose father had acquired these from the uh, uh, guy that handled the Seuss account uh, for a product called Flit. Some of you may remember Flit insecticide. Probably the most famous place I've seen it was in the Godfather movie when Marlon Brando has a heart attack in his tomato patch with his grandson and the kids got that little pump sprayer. Look at the bottom uh, left and you see on, on the right side of that drawing, you see the little can of flip, the guy on the little tank. Um, that was DDT in a can. And these are, the, it was quick Henry, get the flip. That was the tagline. And this was original artwork. Uh, we, we, I wasn't really using it, so we, we sold it after a few years. But that's the letter that Mr. Jackson, I bought it from his daughter, uh, an, an original letter um, from Dr. Seuss kind of telling you um, the provenance of, the, those, of these three pieces. This is the other one. Uh, it wasn't signed by Seuss, Seuss that was interesting. It may have been under the, uh, the matting, but I've never I never took it apart. We did. Uh, um, sell that one off too. This is a, a poster we have again, and now you're starting to see, and I would like you to pay uh, kind of special attention to that mosquito. It says Quick Henry the Flit, as I said, the tagline. And uh, this was, uh, I guess, DDT, it'd kill you, me, fleas, flies, uh, mosquitoes, just about anything. Um, pretty heavy duty stuff. But notice the tank and the uh, now the military theme that he's starting to get into during this period. And I had this from 2004, a first day cover uh, of uh, a, a, somebody made a flit um, cachet on this particular cover. And I thought this one was cute. It has a can of flit in the rowboat. And also notice the uh, mosquito drilling a hole in the guy's head there. 
uh, the fisherman with the uh, rod and reel. Uh, I didn't know this until I ran across it one day that Dr. Seuss, like all these uh, political cartoonists and, and book illustrators and what have you, they all wanted to do commercial art. There was a lot of money in it, not just for Esso. So uh, he was doing advertisements. This is a scarce ad uh, for GE, General Electric, Mazda lamps, light bulbs. Uh, just a fun little illustration. I imagine it probably took him about 20 minutes to pump that out and yet um, make a good bit of money. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit on the left there. Can you build a substantial V, V for victory, out of turtles? And notice what it says there, dawdling producer. So in other words, in America, as we're ramping up, ready to enter the war with the Lend-Lease Act uh, to help out the Brits and so on, um, it was really important. Production was essential in our factories and, and, and in agriculture and so on. And so can you build a substantial V for victory out of turtles? And what is that reminiscent of? Not only the turtles we saw on the judge cover in After Dark in the Park, but also Yertle the Turtle. And Yertle the Turtle has very, very serious political ramifications because the big turtle was supposed to be Hitler um, and taking over the smaller countries, whether it was the low countries, uh, France, uh, Czechoslovakia, so on and so on, Austria. So this is a, a, a very important book, Dr. Seuss Goes to War. I show this cache uh, and this cover only because they're showing the book. Um, there's a, uh, one of the uh, items that'll be coming up shortly in the presentation um, is actually in this book from our collection. But uh, it's, if you're interested in Dr. Seuss's wartime art, um, that, that's the, uh, the, the, the Bible, if you will, for it. Now, this, um, is one, this is a cropped down version of the cover of an original PM Daily newspaper from New York City in our collection. And he says, remember, one more lollipop and then you all go home. So he's showing an appeaser. This is really critical because these appeasers were guys like in Britain, like Chamberlain and guys like Senators Wheeler and Nye in America, Charles Lindbergh, um, the Catholic priest in, in Detroit, Father Charles uh, Coughlin. Um, many of these guys were anti-Semites, they were pro-Nazi and they were really trying isolationists, if you will, um, but beyond just the isolationism. And uh, you notice that these are Nazi dragons or serpents of some sort, just waiting to, uh, you know, to trounce on and devour the appeaser. And uh, these were the kinds of cartoons. This is another one I've cropped down out of the paper. Um, so you see uh, the, the bird representing Uncle Sam um, said the bird in the midst of a blitz and you know, the blitz uh, going on of London, the uh, uh, German uh, Air Force, the Luftwaffe, um, you know, trying to take England by air first before an invasion. Up to now, you've scored very few hits, so I'll sit on my canny, old star spangled fanny, and on it he sits and he sits. So again, his little poems, his little ditties in there, and showing that, uh, you know, hey, listen, this is what's going on in the world. We've probably taken a few hits. Um, this is uh, home sweet home. And then he shows, I don't like to brags, but when I bit Colonel McCormick, it established the greatest all-time itch on record. And for those of you who may not know, uh, the Chicago Tribune was owned by Colonel McCormick. And he was, along with Lindbergh, uh, anti-Semite, isolationist, uh, um, uh, pro-fascism uh, kind of guy. So he says uh, they were bit by the anti-Roosevelt bug. And of course, they all all these guys hated um, um, FDR. So this is another really interesting uh, political cartoon, uh, all kind of little insects uh, that he did. Just real quick on this one, the anti-access skunk gun. Too many of us are, are, are chasing selfish pleasures when we should be actually trying to prepare to defend ourselves against um, um, the uh, fascists, the Nazis and their collaborators all over Europe. And you can see that's a 1942, um, uh, 1942 publication. And here it shows, um, are some of you familiar with the uh, uh, overrun countries that came out in 1943 and 1944? 
I believe there were 11, I'm, I'm, I forget the exact number, but uh, somebody has come out with all these um, overrun countries, um, first day of issue covers with all sorts of uh, Dr. Seuss caches on them. And you can see this one similar to the um, uh, USA to Russia and handing out the guns, a similar one to the cartoon. Um, here they are. Here's the uh, 15. Uh, they came out over a 15 month period, 13 commemorative overrun country stamps. And this is the whole list from Poland to Korea, um, not just the European countries, of course, but the, those run by the uh, overrun by the Axis powers of uh, Italy, Japan, and of course, Germany. Now, this is one of my favorite cartoons, and I have the full paper that this ran in. Look at the date, the day after the uh, Japanese surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, uh, December 8th of 1941. This is the cartoon that ran in PM Daily newspaper. He never knew what hit him. So for all these guys that we mentioned earlier, all the isolationists and the pro-fascists and the anti-Semites, um, this, is, this is exactly um, what, what, what just exploded and blew them right off their fannies. This is a rather large original Dr. Seuss political cartoon. Uh, it's actually framed and uh, hanging right here behind me in our home. Um, this is a remarkable drawing that shows um, Adolf Hitler painting a picture of what Germania is. Notice the little hit Hitler cherubs at the top. He, he writes in plenty and labor and peace and truth and law all the things that uh, obviously the fascists, the Germans and their collaborators all were not. And the gentleman on the right on the bottom there is John Kudahe, and he was an American ambassador um, to several countries uh, throughout the, um, uh, the war kind of kicking off in Europe. And so here's Hitler trying to, um, uh, um, you know, kind of sell him a bill of goods. In other words, selling the Americans a, uh, um, a, a whole deal, if you will. And I found this one from 1943, the Belgian overrun country stamp uh, with our artwork. And uh, the, as you see on, on the original drawing, that little bit of uh, um, uh, text was taken off. Somebody had scraped that off. And uh, those, uh, there you are, Johnny. It was, his first name was John. Um, sell that to your suckers in the USA. So uh, that pretty much sums it up. In this particular drawing uh, shows up in that book, Dr. Seuss Goes to War. Uh, I don't own this letter, but I thought it was really interesting when I ran across it. It talks about how in 1975, his original artwork for PM Daily newspaper cartoons were going for $175. Man, I wish that's all I would have paid for it. These things sell for in the thousands now. Uh, here's another one. I mentioned this guy, uh, uh, Charles Coughlin, Father Coughlin. Um, and he says, not bad, Coughlin, but where are you going to start? When are you going to start printing this in German? And notice on the, he had a paper called Social Justice, nasty, nasty newspaper. And uh, notice it says Vater Coughlin. And so he says it in German instead of uh, um, in, uh, in English. Many of you are uh, familiar with this uh, uh, poem by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I now shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. It's a beautiful poem about ecology and nature and the earth and so on. And it says, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Well, we have this cut from a uh, uh, PM Daily newspaper. That's, of course, Hitler with the swastika armband. And the guy on the right is Pierre Laval. He was the head of the uh, French Vichy collaborist Nazi government uh, during the war. Laval was actually hung after the war. Uh, but he, look at this cartoon. Only God can make a tree to furnish sport for you and me. And that's uh, the French and the Germans collaborating and hanging their Jewish population uh, for sport. Uh, very chilling, chilling, probably the most chilling political cartoon I have in the collection done by Dr. Seuss. And again, I found this on a um, uh, first day cover from Albania, uh, the Albania overrun country stamp. This one is uh, just another one we have. They're serving roast Adolf at Joe's house tonight, December 24th of 1941. 
kind of the time frame on that is pretty good. I really like this one. Uh, so this guy, the rat in the cage there is uh, Jacques Dorio. And he was originally a French communist and quite a, pop, uh, quite a uh, significant guy in French politics in the 30s. Uh, he ended up becoming a, a real serious, hated Jews, uh, people of the Jewish faith, and became a ardent uh, Nazi, and to the point where he actually served in the SS. Um, and this is a great cartoon, a new pet from the sewers of Paris. Um, you know, Seuss really knew what was going on. I mean, not a lot of people. You can see that's, a, I think, copyright 43. Uh, the best part of the Dorio story is he was in a car in the, in the south of Germany in 1945 fleeing the Allies. And a uh, Allied plane uh, strafed his car and killed him while he was traveling. Uh, he's actually buried in Germany, in the south of Germany. Uh, and again, this is uh, this guy, Sam Zevleski. Uh, boy, he must have really been a good collector because uh, there's that particular image on a uh, uh, Austria stamp. And again, these are, uh, this goes on and on. We have quite a few of these, uh, you know, kind of the United Nations. Notice the swastika on the shorts of the guy that the UN is slapping in the head there. And this one I thought was a little bit more unusual. This is a, a letter to Ruth Cunningham in 1943 from Camp Peary and, uh, uh, in Virginia. And what's really interesting on this, this is either printed or rubber stamped on the, what you, the bottom part is the back side of the envelope. You can make out that flap. And it's uh, kind of a clever um, way. It's a, you know, a cachet on the back. It says the gas you burn up in your car in one whole year would only take a light tank 653 miles. So basically, you know, save gas that uh, uh, the man, uh, the soldier in his tank is way more important than uh, some casual trip you may have to take. Um, this is classic, although this one wasn't sent until 1946, as you can see the uh, postmark there to Ruth Cunningham. This, this is uh, semi-hilarious. I mean, you'd have to put yourself back in history uh, and, and, and kind of appreciate the hatred of you know, Hirohito and Hitler, the Japanese and the, uh, uh, the German leaders. And here's the two of them getting together, married exactly one year today when the Axis powers were formed. And look at this, Hashimura Frankenstein. That's the resultant of the uh, marriage of uh, their baby. And it's, uh, it's, it's mildly humorous today, uh, but somewhat offensive from a, uh, uh, obviously a cultural standpoint in today's world. Um, and this one I love, if, if you're familiar with Mein Kampf, that means uh, my battle. And that's the, uh, the book where Hitler outlined his uh, domination of the world, the destruction of the Jewish people. He wrote it while in prison in Germany uh, in the 1920s. And so this is interesting. This is Tojo, um, the head of the Japanese army, um, um, reading it. And he says, now what in the blazes am I going to use for Jews? Uh, kind of really satirical, uh, wild stuff. These little like uh, uh, one and a half or one and a half by two inch little advertisements, I've blown them up so you can kind of see it. These uh, just really um, rough caricatures of Tojo and, uh, and Hitler. These appeared, I have all these uh, um, pulp magazines and uh, old baseball programs and so on. But these things appear in to uh, sell war for to advertise war bonds. And going back to World War I, um, when he raised all the war money for war bonds, um, look, Seuss just really got into war bonds. We'll see some more of that in a little bit. Um, this is a, uh, this is a, a uh, reproduction, but really nicely done in color, a hand painted uh, cache uh, from 1943 on a uh, Army and Navy for Defense two cent stamp. Uh, really, really good, um, uh, nice little cache. I think the same person did this one. Uh, this one is uh, the postmark is from 44. But these are beautiful uh, hand painted caches. Now this is the real Seuss one that somebody just copied, uh, you know, somehow uh, transferred onto this um, um, particular cover. And notice now it says yellow belly. So of course, yellow for the Japanese, a, a racial slur. Um, and uh, yellow belly meaning a coward. This is a May 10th of 1945. 
two days after the uh, surrender of the um, Nazis and their collaborators in Europe, and yet several months before September uh, when the Japanese surrendered. Um, this one is really something. Look at this war bonds uh, cache by Dr. Seuss. It's going to cause billions to defang the Jap, the Jap snake, buy US war bonds and stamps. 1943, uh, up in Ithaca, New York, not too far from Utica, where I grew up. And I have this Japanese hunting license. Many of our hunting licenses like this, not the Seuss one, they didn't want that there, but are on exhibit at the US Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, along with a lot of our other propaganda material um, for an exhibit called uh, Americans in the Holocaust. But you notice both of those illustrations we've seen previously appear in this Japanese hunting license. Uh, open season, loyalty to American ideals and uh, uh, bounty. And it's just, it's, I mean, it's quite vulgar when you read it, but it's, uh, it was uh, quite popular during that particular period. Uh, I found these modern caches, obviously from 2004, uh, the Sioux stamp, but I did find these two um, that somebody used uh, even in 2004, still using those war bond things. Now, this is really, uh, this is Dr. Seuss, and these are um, not completely hard to find, but they're scarce and uh, rather expensive. So the item on the right is a anti-malaria booklet that Dr. Seuss did while he was a major in the War Department. That is his same mosquito that you saw in the flit ads. And it's called, this is Anne, that's the name he gave to the mosquito, and it says she's dying to meet you. And this giant poster, these were all on exhibit at the uh, Pacific War Museum out in Fredericksburg, Texas, the National War of the Pacific Museum. This is a, uh, a huge, probably three foot by four foot poster. On the back side, it's called a news map. And they, uh, it has all the news of the war and so on, how many weeks we've been involved, how long the war has been going on. But the back side is this giant anti-malaria poster that was put together by uh, Theodore Geisel while he was in the army. And of course you see the mosquito drinking the blood on there, really rare stuff. Fantastic poster, save the squander bug. Although the squander bug was already in existence in the UK uh, as a conservation um, uh, kind of campaign, he designed his own squander bug eating, you know, obviously uh, eating money. Uh, to buy war bonds. That's a beautiful poster also been on exhibit. And these are other items where you see these same illustrations used over and over again, uh, the cover of a woman's war finance committee brochure. Um, you can see the uh, inside uh, where the squander bug appears in advertisements and, and so on. One is from PM Daily newspaper. Now this banner poster is really quite nice. Um, it's, it's a fairly good size and it says save the squander, starve the squander bug. And uh, I found this um, uh, uh, same, the same um, poster on a cache here from 1943 uh, for a um, uh, overrun country, the Netherlands issue. And this was kind of interesting. Stop them praying with their heads toward Mecca. It's insulting how their end is pointing towards Berlin. So uh, there's another Albania stamp and uh, uh, Albania over on country stamp, just interesting Dr. Seuss stuff. As we kind of wind down a bit here, private snafu that we mentioned before, situation normal all um, uh, screwed up here, um, is um, this is what one of the cartoons looked like. And what's really interesting here that Mel Blank, who you know is the voice behind Bugs Bunny and so many of those characters, was the voiceover in the uh, private snafu. And um, Theodore Geisel was a screenwriter. And if you listen to some of these, these are all public domain now. Um, you can find these out on YouTube and what have you. When you listen to them, you'll actually pick up the parts that Dr. Seuss did the screenwriting for, because of course it gets into his little quippy ditties. Now this, your job in Germany, this is serious stuff. So in 1945, the war's not quite over. It's not quite May yet in, in 1945. The uh, Signal Corps, the Army Pictorial Service came out with a, uh, a, a, a film called Your Job in Germany. And it was quite heavy duty. It was a, don't fraternize with the Germans. They're horrible people. They're a warring people for generations. 
Um, it was really quite a powerful anti-German film and uh, uh, specifically for our troops there. This was not public. However, um, after in 1946 or later in 45, um, I think it was Frank Capra got a hold of this and they got the rights to it and produced it as Hitler Lives uh, or with a question mark after it. And um, this, yeah, there it is. Warner Brothers presents Hitler Lives. And uh, you can see that it's um, um, uh, <laughs> just black and white, powerful anti-German film. And it won an Academy Award in 46 uh, for one of the best documentaries. So they're using these government films, these anti-German, anti-access kind of films. Um, again, another one, the same thing only later when, the, uh, when we beat Japan in September when they, uh, of 1945, they came out with our job in Japan. Same sort of thing, showing the Japanese how they took over the Philippines, how they took over Korea, how they, the destruction and the death and, and believe me, I've lectured in Harbin, China, where the Japanese did their biological and chemical warfare experiments against the Chinese people. And actually, we have things that we gifted to the museum there. It is unbelievable what the Japanese did throughout Asia. So this is showing, again, the Japanese as a, um, as a warring people. And much like um, the film produced for, for the anti-German uh, perspective, um, these, they were screen written by uh, and co-screen written in many cases by Theodore Geisel. And um, in 1947, Design for Death took the, uh, our job in Japan and turned it into a 1947 Academy Award winning documentary. And this is a poster, a very, very rare poster in our collection. It's huge. It's one of those big ones that would have gone on the outside of the building advertising the upcoming um, uh, uh, productions. Seek, Jap secret films, still using the word Jap, seized by US agents, never shown before. Police state war rackets exposed. Bomb, 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 everything you can imagine. And what's incredible is I, I, I made uh, and enlarged the bottom of the poster here. This is number 48 of 704. I have a partial one, it's got some tears in it. But this, this particular poster is copyrighted 48 by RKO Pictures uh, in the U US. And notice the um, uh, embossed um, wording there along with the, um, uh, the text next to it. Property of the National Screen Service, licensed for display in connection with this exposition, ex exhibition only. It should be returned immediately thereafter. And uh, I guess a few of these weren't returned and fortunately, uh, several different iterations of this are uh, in our collection. And here I just took, this is the one, um, the Japanese one. Um, uh, and you can, this is the federal government one written for the screen by Theodore Geisel and his first wife, Helen. And just to uh, kind of conclude here, some of the things that uh, you'll see in, in later days, um, you, you know that the United Nations has three different post offices. Uh, let's see, New York, uh, Vienna, and uh, I think the other one is, uh, let me think here, Vienna and Geneva. And uh, these are just different uh, uh, for World Oceans Day uh, using the fish, you know, the red fish, blue fish, uh, no gefilte fish here, but. Uh, some different uh, covers with the different uh, from the different UN post offices. And they're quite nice, uh, big collector items and uh, people just love Dr. Seuss artwork. And you can see this one here. And uh, this is one of my favorite slides to show you. That's uh, my wife. Uh, this was up at the Georgetown, Texas Library, one of our many different Seuss exhibits we've had. And you notice Michelle with her uh, hat in a hat bag, but especially her t-shirt. And it says one fish, two fish, red fish, gefilte fish. And gefilte fish is a, uh, um, a kind of a Jewish related food. Many people don't care for it, but uh, it's kind of fun nonetheless. Now I don't have these in the collection. I, I just didn't feel like spending the money on them, but this is from uh, uh, 19, I don't know, 97, these are, let me see what this is. That's the, the date at the bottom is uh, the Seuss uh, copyright date, but these are more modern uh, out of Australia. 
um, Dr. Seuss uh, kind of Christmas stamps. They came in these uh, little uh, illumination uh, folders, if you will. So people are still using his images on a lot of different types of things. And this is the one, the happy 115th birthday, um, also out of Australia. Uh, didn't buy this one, but it's really adorable. You see the Grinch, the cat in the hat, the uh, fox and socks, and, and so on, a bunch of the characters that are he's so famous for. And uh, finally, um, this is from 1956, I believe. I think we'll find the date somewhere. He did, I found this, I bought it from a guy in La Jolla. Uh, he had a few of these, uh, Signs of Civilization. So Dr. Seuss, living in La Jolla, um, decided that it was okay to do, they were trying to keep uh, billboards out of the, um, out of the community. They, La Jolla is a very wealthy, beautiful community. And he illustrated a, uh, a booklet for the uh, La Jolla Town Council, an anti-billboard campaign. And although I don't have this newspaper, the guy that sold me the booklet uh, said it was the only one of these he had and he wanted to keep it. Um, this is what the Signs of Civilization by the uh, La Jolla Town Council, uh, what it ran in, in the newspaper. And I think it is 1956. I think that's what it says on the paper there. But anyway, uh, I think that I'd like to read this. I know it's a little bit long, but there's a cartoonist named Art Spiegelman. You may know of him uh, from his um, Holocaust uh, pulp fiction uh, uh, books called Mouse, M-A-U-S. And uh, he really talks about Dr. Seuss. And I really think it's important. He says, these cartoons that we saw today rail against isolationism, racism, and anti-Semitism with a conviction and fervor lacking in most other American editorial pages of the period. These are virtually the only editorial cartoons outside the communist and black press that decried the military's Jim Crow policies and Charles Lindbergh's anti-Semitism. Sue said that he had no great causes or interest in social issues until Hitler and explained that PM, that's the newspaper, was against people who pushed other people around. I like that. More of a humanist than an ideologue, one of those Groucho rather than Karl Marxist, Dr. Seuss made these drawings with the fire of honest indignation and anger that fuels all real political art. If they have a flaw, it's an absolutely endearing one. They're funny. And with that, my wife always tells me, don't cry because it's over. Smile that it happened. And today you are youer than you, truer than true. There is no one alive that is youer than you. And I think we all need to understand that. And uh, if there's a message I would find in all of this, in these political cartoons of the period, if everyone was just a little kind to one another, perhaps that all these types of uh, very heavy political cartoons would never be needed. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and address any questions or comments. Um, well, Greg, thank you very much. That was a very good presentation. You covered an awful lot of ground, many years, many parts of the world. So uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Thank you.